But this is not about heroes, nor is it about deeds or lands, nor glory, honor, might, majesty or power, except war. Above all, I am not concerned with poetry. My subject is war, and the pity of war. The poetry is in the pity. All a poet can do today is warn. For me, Wilfred Owen is the greatest poet of the First World War. No one has ever written as vividly about battle. There had been terrible wars before, of course, but World War I brought the fruits of the Industrial Age to killing, massed it, mechanised it, and turned it into wholesale slaughter. Between 1914 and 1918, nine million men were to die. Wilfred Owen was the first poet to give a voice to those men. When he died in action at the age of 25, here on the banks of the canal at Ors in northern France, he'd written over 50 iconic poems, now recognised as some of the greatest war poetry ever penned. Like many people, I first came across Wilfred Owen as a teenager. After Shakespeare, he's the second most studied poet in Britain, after all. And yet during his lifetime, by the time he was killed here on the banks of the canal, there hadn't been a single collection of his poems published. This is all the more remarkable, it seems to me, because not only did Owen reinvent war poetry, there is a case for saying, and I know it's a very big case, there's a case for saying he reinvented modern poetry itself. His verse is angry, it's arresting, it's vivid, it's terse. It's far, far more vivid than any kind of war reporting could ever be. Just listen to this, which is his most famous poem, Dulce et Decorum Est. Bent double, like old beggars under sacks, knock need, coughing like hags we cursed through the sludge till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge men marched asleep many, many had, had lost, lost their, their boots, boots but, but limped, limped on, on bloodshot. bloodshot all went lame all blind drunk with fatigue deaf even to the hoots of tired outstripped five nines which dropped behind Gas! Gas! Quick, boys! An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim, through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin. If you could hear with every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you, you would, would not tell, tell with such high zest. zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie dulce et decorum est pro patria mori it's stunning but one of the many ironies of owen's story is that what made him a great poet also killed him it was being thrown into the horror of war that turned him from an unexceptional frankly rather wet young man into a proper poet and a genuine military hero. What could be more opposite than war and poetry? And yet the reason Wilfred Owen is such a great poet is that he embodies these contradictions. He was a very ordinary man who produced extraordinary verse which pulsed with this anger against the armchair generals and the warmongers who sent young men off to die and yet at the same time dignified and celebrated those who had to do the fighting. His most famous poem rails against the idea of dying for your country and yet of course that's precisely what he did. Wilfred was born in Oswestry, rural Shropshire, in spring 1893 to Tom and Susan Owen. 
He was the eldest child of four with brothers Harold and Colin and a sister Mary. The family lived comfortably enough in a large house built by Wilfred's grandfather. But when they fell on hard times they were forced to sell the house and all its contents, moving to a more modest place in industrial Birkenhead. This abrupt fall intensified the relationship between Wilfred and his ambitious and domineering mother Susan. She pinned all her hopes on her eldest son and dreamed one day he'd make a name for himself. When he was a baby, she'd cut a lock of his hair and playfully labelled it Sir Wilfred Edward Salter Owen. Wilfred enjoyed his mother's attention. If he was away for only a few days, he wanted to tell her what he was up to, even as a five-year-old. She was devoted to him, he was devoted to her, he wrote to her all the time, over 500 letters at least. In fact, his letters to her from the front are our main source for knowing the sort of life that he led there. The very earliest of them is this, which is a card. I guess he must have gone away camping or something. And he says, My dear mother, I know that you have got there safely. We are making huts. I have got a lantern and we're lighting them up tonight. I remain your loving son, Wilfred. There aren't many five-year-olds who could possibly attempt even handwriting as good as this, let alone uh, as sophisticated a style of letter. By the time Wilfred was 11, he was a sensitive, bookish child, so in love with Keats and Shakespeare that he was already dreaming of becoming a poet himself. Inspired by a holiday in Broxton, Cheshire, Owen even wrote some early and, I have to say, not particularly successful attempts of his own. At Broxton, by the hill where first I felt my boyhood fill with uncontainable movements, there was born my poethood. If this rather precious boy was to achieve his ambition, he would have to enter the world of books. University was the thing. But in Edwardian England, standard education was only provided up to the age of 12. It obviously wasn't going to be enough. But university was the preserve of the rich and privileged 1% of the population. At 18, Owen did manage to get a place at London University. But as he could only study part-time through correspondence, he needed to earn enough money to keep himself alive. Writing to his mother, he began to weigh up his options. It seems the time is ripe for me to wrench myself from home. Which risk shall I take? Borrowing money, or put myself at the mercy of a reverend man, to become the assistant of some hard-worked or studiously inclined parson, who may be exacting, eccentric and intolerant? Owen's mother was intensely religious, so she encouraged him when he decided to come here to the village of Dunstan, near Reading, to take a job as a vicar's assistant. His room was up there on the first floor of the vicarage. So between the ages of 18 and 20, his afternoons were taken up in visiting the poor, or as he put it in a letter to his mother, sitting on uncomfortable chairs, talking to uncomfortable people in uncomfortable cottages. Owen's host and employer was the Reverend Herbert Wigan, an intelligent and cultured man whose life, although not exactly luxurious, was in stark contrast with that of his parishioners. A hundred years ago, this area was rife with poverty and disease, and life expectancy short. Many of the congregation lived in one-room hovels. Just down the road from the vicarage is All Saints Church. I've come to meet local historian Jean Eastwood. What would a, a, a vicar's assistant have to do? Attend services, and some, on some Sundays there were about six services. Um, mother's meetings in the afternoons, and uh, he was also made a correspondent of Dunstan School. What does that mean? <laughs> it sounds very grand, and he, <laughs> he found it very ironic and laughable. So he writes all this boring stuff like the he minutes of the previous this. meeting were read and confirmed. That's right. He's got nice writing, hasn't he? He's got very clear writing. Mm. It says here the master's gardens, and he put an apostrophe there and joined the R and the S, which he shouldn't have done, of course. Um, and <laughs> and they, they agreed upon a new fence. A new fence was agreed upon. The old, old gate, gate was, to, was be to be repaired. This was quite a, 
It was a quite a mundane existence for a young, energetic man. Do you think he enjoyed his time here? The situation in the vicarage itself he didn't like. He, he didn't like the fact that here was this man living on his own and he had this whole host of servants. The vicar? The vicar, yes. And whereas he was going out and visiting these poor people in the cottages, um, suffering from diseases and so on, he found it all so hypocritical somehow or other. I am holding aloof from the shortbreads, and I mean to give some to a little girl of five, fast sinking under consumption. Isn't it pitiable? Could he retain his own faith in those circumstances? No, I think that was the problem. His experience here, and perhaps particularly amongst the poor people, and seeing their suffering and their illnesses, and especially amongst the children, filled him with uh, pity. And, and that came out later when he was on the front, because he felt pity for the soldiers. It was too much. He didn't have enough time to study and he just didn't really believe. Owen decided to leave Dunstan for good. Murder will out, and I have murdered my false creed. If a true one exists, I shall find it. Escape from this hotbed of religion I now long for more than I can ever have conceived. To leave Dunstan will mean a terrible bust up. So, by 20, Owen still hadn't fulfilled his mother's ambitions. He'd lost his faith, missed his next lot of university exams, and hadn't written much decent poetry. A bit of a washout so far. Still without a clue what to do with his life, he needed a change of scene. In autumn 1913, Owen left England for France on a sort of gap year. He taught at a language school in Bordeaux, and now he was free at last. He started to drink wine took up smoking and he stopped going to church every Sunday. I have been able to fortify my tissue with real Bordeaux, red and white. I am conscious of at least an appearance of robustness in my face. The villa is not ideal in plan, but pretty and practical. Here is a rough plan of the house. The piano is wicked, absolutely untouchable. Ooh la la, I am immensely happy. But Owen's idyllic time in France was about to come to an abrupt end. On the 28th of June 1914, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was assassinated on the streets of Sarajevo, thereby triggering the most industrial-scale slaughter in history. Six weeks later, on the 4th of August 1914, with the Germans attacking France, Britain was dragged into the war. The British War Minister, Lord Kitchener, began a frantic recruitment campaign. Hundreds of thousands of young men volunteered to fight, swept along on a tide of propaganda. The popular press was filled with patriotic slogans, and even poetry was put to use as a recruiting sergeant. For example, the verses of a woman called Jessie Pope, who wrote in the Daily Mail, A gun, a gun to shoot the Hun, a cudgel of oak to clout him, a Jellico ship to give him jip, and a Kitchener's boy to out him. Listening to jingoistic tosh like that, you really could believe the war might be over by Christmas. But a year later, the carnage seemed unending, with hundreds of thousands dying on the battlefields. It was now clear the end of the war was anything but imminent. By 1915, Wilfred Ohm was getting increasingly uncomfortable with his position. He'd heard the guns booming in northern France, he'd been to a military hospital and seen the terrible injuries suffered by young men who had volunteered. And literary heroes of his, like Rudyard Kipling, were encouraging young men to join up. But most of all, he feared that a German victory would mean the extinguishing of the English culture and language. He wanted to fight, he said, to save the language of Keats and Shakespeare. 